Father, which art in heaven, thank you once again for the breath of life, oh God. Thank you for uh, your goodness unto us throughout today. No matter what we face throughout the day, mighty God, you, you have seen us through. And you have brought us uh, thus far this evening so that we could sit at your foot, so Lord God, so that we could listen to what you have given your man servant to prepare. So be efficient, every one of us. Father, help us to uh, be obedient to your call and let your Holy Spirit work in our mind and our heart so that we will be more and more, we'll be like Jesus. Thank you for your goodness, oh God. Your goodness is ever before us. We thank you for it. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. <clears throat> amen. Number 198. Good evening, everyone. 198. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain, for me who him to death pursued. Amazing love, how can it be for thou, my God, just die for me? Amazing love, what can it be for thou, my God, should it die for me? He left his father's throne above. So free, so infinite his grace, emptied himself of all but love, and bled for Adam's helpless race. This mercy all immense and free, for oh my God, it found out me. Was amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Amen. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's land. Thine I diffuse a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flame with light. My chain fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldest die for me? No condemnation now I dread, Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him, my living head, and clothed with righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne, and claim the crowd through Christ my own. It was amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Amen. Amen. Two, one, three. Jesus is coming again. Lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring. Jesus is coming again. Cheer up, people, grins, be joyful and sing. Jesus is coming again. Coming again, coming again. Jesus is coming again. Echo it, hilltops, proclaim it, he plains. Jesus is coming again. Coming in glory, 
the lamb that was slain. Jesus is coming again. He's coming again. Yes, he's coming again. Jesus is coming again. Events of earth tell a vast wandering throng. Jesus is coming again. Tempest and whirlwind, the anthem prolong. Jesus is coming again. Coming again, coming again. Jesus is coming again. Nations are angry, by this we do know, Jesus is coming again. Knowledge increases, men run to and fro, Jesus is coming again. Coming again, he's coming again. Jesus is coming again. Amen. Praise the Lord. We know that Jesus is coming again. We have our opening song, 315. It's a day like it's your alone tonight. And Jesus, 315. <laughs> okay, Jesus the language is not yet today? She's not on. Okay, okay. So I'll put on the music then. <laughs> Also, with the God, a common heavenly friend, a light to shine upon the road that leads me to the land. Return. Praise the Lord over oh, our closer walk with God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hello, bridges. Time is yours. God's at the Praise the Lord, brother. I want to thank my dear sister again for that gospel and song. Beautiful. And I appreciate the accompaniment of the soundtrack in the background. That was very nice. I asked the other night, will there be music in heaven? There certainly will. I'm thankful again to be here in all of you living rooms and kitchens or bedrooms or wherever you may, you may be in your cars, maybe. I'm thanking the Lord for another day that he has blessed us with his breath of life, the same breath of life he gave our brother Adam in Genesis 2, 7, when the Bible says he breathed his breath of life into his nostrils and 
dear brother Adam became a living soul. So I'm just thankful that God is so merciful, so gracious, so patient with you and me. Though we do not deserve that grace by any means, the unmerited favor that we are blessed with cannot be put into words. The Bible says the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and is saved. Proverbs 18.10. So let us take a moment before we begin our study, our lesson, and bow down to the creator of everything. Amen. I'm going to kneel. Our loving, kind, heavenly father, our wonderful king, savior, lord, brother, and prince. We're so thankful, Lord, to be in your presence again this evening for this fourth night of this series that you have navigated. Nothing in me, Lord, gives me the ability to do anything before your people. The Bible says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And it is also a very fearful thing to stand before your people and present your truth. Lord, what man on this earth is worthy? None. Only through the unction of your Holy Spirit can we even to begin to utter these profound, powerful, deep, and saving words. I ask, Lord, that you would please be with us this evening. Again, please navigate through the study. Help me, Lord, to read, to see, to think, to comprehend, to remember. All of these things are, are complementary and they're all necessary to be able to carry forward your truth this evening to your people. Lord, I thank you in advance for answering this prayer. And I thank you so much. We all love you and want to live with you forever. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So for those of you who may have missed a night here and there, just to reiterate what I shared last night, we decided to... When I say we, I mean myself and the Holy Spirit, amen. I felt impressed to extend one more night. So we're going to have tonight's meeting, tomorrow night session, and then Friday night, Vespers, very special Vespers regarding our preparation, the real true preparation for the crisis and Jesus coming. And also we're gonna skip over Saturday night. We're gonna return Sunday night for our final meeting on Sunday evening, same time, same place. And then we will, after that meeting concludes, we will proceed with a question and answer session, and then we will go ahead and, and wind everything up. Amen. So we have quite a bit of information to squeeze in tonight. We may end up going two hours, and I pray that you all hang in there and stick with me. I believe that God has something to say to all of us, including myself, definitely, first and foremost. So let me get to the share mode so we can go ahead and get started. <clears throat> Okay, can we all see the our ministry logo? Is it there? Can everyone see our logo? Yes, it's there. All right, thank you, my sister. Thank you. The title of our series this week, of course, starting on this past Sunday night, January 1st, 2023, is the rural science of life, evangelism, and salvation, the rural science of life, evangelism, and salvation. Let's go ahead and get started. Again, a lot to cover, and I'm going to pray again for a blessing. Lord, please, as we go through these scriptures, spirit of prophecy quotes, we dialogue, we remember, we retain, as we contemplate, Lord, and consider so much that we have to, to understand and, and just digest tonight. Please help us to, to remember, help us to recall it, help us to be able to regurgitate it to others. Help us, Lord, most of all, to understand the importance of it in, in the context of eternal life. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This is part two. Our subtitle for tonight is Another Ark to Build. Part two, Another Ark to Build. Just to repeat what we ended with last night. If the same sins that existed in the times of Noah exist in our world today. That means, my brothers and sisters, the solution must be the same today as it was then. God is not calling you and I, us, to build boats, but he's calling us to build country outpost centers, the modern day 
ark, the modern day ark. Colossians chapter one, verse 18. Now we know that this ark, the ark that Noah built was very important. The modern day antitypical ark that God wants us to build is also very important. Where he wants this ark built is very important. In other words, in relation to city or country life, he wants it to be built and constructed and, 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 and I guess built up and raised up, if I can use that term, in the country. But also, what are we supposed to be doing there once we get in there is the question. And also, who was running the show? Who was in charge? Who was our leader regarding this, this evangelistic plan or strategy that God has set up for his people? Verse 18 of Colossians 1, and he, meaning Jesus, he is the head of the body, the church. That's educational, isn't it? So the Bible's telling us right here in Colossians 1, 18, Jesus is educating us. He's teaching us that he, Jesus, is in charge of the body, and the body is his church, his church. Clear. Who is the beginning? Jesus, the firstborn from the dead that in all things he might have the preeminence, preeminence. Country Living, page 30. The cities are to be worked from outposts, said the messenger of God. Shall not the cities be warned? Yes, not by God's people living in them, but by their visiting them to warn them of what is coming upon the earth. Very profound answer there. Now remember, the messenger is an angel from heaven. An angel, I would say probably at least 18 to 20 feet tall. So I think if this angel appeared in any of our homes at this very moment, that angel would have our full attention, wouldn't he? So let's give that angel through the prophet, through the Lord, through the Holy Spirit, our attention right now. The angel says, shall not the cities be warned? That's the question the angel's asking. The angel answers his own question, yes. Then he tells us, how they're supposed to be warned. We're warning the cities, our evangelistic plans, our evangelistic commission is not by God's people, us living in them, but by their, meaning us, visiting them, the cities, to warn them, the inhabitants of the cities, of what is coming upon the earth. That is our commission. That is our charge. Same book, page 31 repeatedly is that once every decade no repeatedly the lord has instructed us that we are to work the cities from outpost centers hmm. in these cities we are to have houses of worship which is preaching as memorials for god but institutions for the publication publishing of our literature for the healing of the sick healing and for the training or teaching of workers are to be established outside the cities. Did you get that? She says, especially is it important that our youth be shielded from the temptations of city life. So these four components here, these four, like I call branches, are contained in Matthew chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. These are the four great branches of God's work which is in turn, by, by default, our work. So this is the four-step model. Houses of worship or churches are to be located where? In the city. Publishing literature evangelism base should be located where? In the country. The healing sanitarium work base should be located where? In the country. The training or teaching of workers should be located where? In the country. Now, I'm sure you can probably all kind of formulate the reason why God has set up his plan and structure this way. He doesn't want the workers to be affected and influenced and corrupted by city life. So we have our worship in the cities, houses of worship, but we don't perform the work or prepare to begin to do the work in the cities. That has to be done where we're actually living in nature. And there's a reason for that. And we're going to see that. We touched on that last night. So repeating, letter 51, 1901, Christ was a Seventh-day Adventist to all intents and purposes. Let's see in what way. Loma Linda messages, page 72a, paragraph one. Listen, please. In the days of Christ, 
there were no sanitariums in the Holy Land, all right? But wherever he went, he, Jesus, he himself was a sanitarium. That's very interesting. I wonder what a sanitarium is. Just the word itself sounds like sanitarium or sanitary or sanitized, maybe something clean or cleansed. Hmm. The great physician carried with him the healing efficacy that was a cure for every disease. How many diseases? Every disease, spiritual and physical. This he imparted to those who were under the afflicting power of the enemy. Hmm. Aren't we all? Healing their diseases and infirmities. Now, moving forward. Remember this quote. God's purpose in giving the third angel's message to the world is to prepare a people to stand true to him during the investigative judgment. The key word there is stand. Remember, Revelation 6, the last verse, verse 17. Who shall be able to stand? Well, my prayer is that it's you and I. Amen. Then she goes on. This is the purpose for which we establish and maintain our publishing houses, our schools, our sanitariums, hygienic restaurants, treatment rooms, and food factories. This is our purpose, she goes on to continue, in carrying forward every line of work in the cause. So I have here highlighted in these six points here, these six bullet points, these six major components of our work, these six lines of our work. We're going to talk about lines in just a few minutes sanitariums. Interesting. She says, it is God's design. Is it important? Yes. It is God's design that our sanitariums shall act an important part in giving the message of Christ's soon coming to those in the highways and byways. So the sanitarium is going to be a key component in that, in giving the message of Jesus is soon coming. Okay. Next, the sanitariums that shall be established are to be God's memorials. In what way? Agencies in the conversion of many souls. Interesting. So you mean the sanitarium, whatever it is, is going to be very, very crucial in converting people to Jesus. All right. Next, our sanitariums have been established for the purpose of preparing a people for the second coming of our Lord and Savior. Now, just based on those three quotes that I just read, I think it's extremely clear that these sanitariums, whatever they are, there's something in them, something inside these places, something inherent to the sanitarium that has a very critical role, will play a very critical role in converting people and preparing them for Jesus' coming. So we need to look a, bit, a little bit further into this. What do you say? So the question I raised is, what is a sanitarium? Well, the original word, brothers and sisters, was sanatorium. A sanatorium is a medical facility for long-term illness, most typically associated with the treatment of tuberculosis in the late 19th and early 20th century, before the discovery of antibiotics. Hmm. Listen, an establishment for the medical treatment of people who are convalescing or have a chronic illness. Are there chronic illnesses in our world today? Absolutely so. Between 1900 and 1925, the number of beds in sanatoriums across the U.S. increased from roughly 4,500 to almost 675,000. Does that sound like disease and affliction and illness and all these things were increasing or decreasing? Certainly increasing. So more sickness, more illness, more disease, more beds necessary, and more sanatoriums necessary. Hmm. Also, many ailing people lacked the money they needed, the what? The money they needed to buy themselves entry into facilities. That's an interesting concept. So I'm sick. I need help to help to reverse my condition or cure my affliction. But if I can't afford it, then I can't be helped. Is that God's plan? We're going to find that out. Or to support them and their families while they were there. 
So what is a sanitarium? A new word created by John Harvey Kellogg, sanitarium. So he reversed or switched the position of one letter and added another one, replaced another one. What is a sanitarium? Let's let inspiration tell us. The Nebraska Reporter, February 28, 1905. It is a place of healing. I say amen. A place in which reforms are to be wrought out. A place in which young men and women are to receive an education in the use of the facilities that God has given for the benefit of suffering humanity. God has placed us in the world to bless one another, and we desire the sanitarium here to give the students in the school a representation of the highest kind of medical missionary work. So what is the sanitarium? I love the first six letters or words of this definition by Sister White. It is a place of healing. Question is, brother, sister, what type of healing are we talking about? We're going to study this. So the sanitarium leads people to Jesus Christ. That's what it's set up and established for. One, to get people well. Two, to teach them to stay well. Is that important? Yes. Three, to teach them to teach others. And four, finally, duplicate the process. That is God's plan for country evangelism, rural science of evangelism and life and salvation. So I have a question for you all. Question. We talked about this the other night. What is God's heaven-sent strategy to revive the sleeping uh, and dead churches, the sleeping and dead churches? Hmm. Answer, combine medical missionary work with the proclamation of the third angel's message, make regular organized efforts to lift the churches out of the dead level in which they have been for how long? For years. Hmm. Send out into the churches workers who will set the principles of health reform connected with the third angel's message before the church. See if the breath of life will not then come into these churches. I love that analogy. Without the breath of life, there's no life. There is no life. Remember, in Genesis 2-7, there were two components. Dust of the earth and the breath of life. He became, Adam became a living soul, according to the text. So she's saying here, you connect the health reform and the third angel's message together. And the breath of life will return to these churches. I say amen. So health reform and medical missionary work. They're one and the same, aren't they? Let's see. Question. Was Jesus a medical missionary? Answer. 1A. Again, we're repeating from the other night. Christ was the great medical missionary. His whole life was a representation of God. He was consumed with his work. 1B. Answer 1B. Christ is the pattern of what constitutes a medical missionary. Remember, he's the great pattern man. He's our, our type, our figure, our, our, our representation, our shadow. Amen. So question again, what is a medical missionary? Well, what are they or what is that? Answer, medical missionary work is the helping hand of God. The helping hand? Okay, I got my attention. So this is, we're talking about now the body of Christ. We're talking about the body of the work. I would like you all, we don't have time to go through every verse of scripture, but if you have a screenshot ability or capability on your computer, or on your phone, whatever you're, or wherever you're watching, take a snapshot of this. It gives us each point of this body the head, and also the accompanying scriptures that explain or justify or prove from the text, from the Bible, that these are all legitimate. The head, Ephesians 1.22. The left arm is teaching, Matthew 4.23. Healing, Matthew 4.23 as well. The right arm, the feet, Nahum 1.15, publishing. The other foot, preaching, Romans 10.15. And we can find all of these components, all four, Teaching, preaching, healing, and publishing in Matthew 4, verses 23 and 24. Actually, in Matthew 4, 24, the word used is fame, which means the same thing. To spread abroad, to publish, to broadcast information, news, and blessing. Amen.
Question, what has God ordained to help enable us to accomplish this work? Can this work be done without God? Absolutely not. Answer, two lines. Hmm, but what does that mean? Question, what are these two lines? Answer, regular and irregular lines. Lines. Remember, we talked about in one manuscript release, page 228, paragraph two, the last sentence, the very last sentence. This is our, our purpose in carrying forward every line of work in the cause. Remember that? Acts 1, 16 and 17. Let's read this. Heavenly Father, please bless your words. Take us inch by inch, point by point through this study, please. In Jesus' name we ask and thank you. Amen. Acts 1, 16 and 17. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus, right? Judas was leading the way, leading out, unfortunately. 17. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this, what is that word? ministry ministry so jesus had a ministry didn't he yes he did we are made sad as we see in many places so much left undone that should be done we're talking about now the regular and irregular lines in the church but the lord will use in the accomplishment of his work means that we do not now see he will raise up from among the common people men and women to do his work even as of old, he called fishermen to be his disciples. Common people, humble people. There will soon be an awakening that will surprise many. Those who do not realize the necessity of what is to be done will be passed by. Is that scary? And the heavenly messengers will work with those who are called the common people, fitting them to carry the truth to many places. Now is the time for us to awake and do what we can, whatever God has ordained us and commissioned us to do. It is time that church members understood that everywhere there is a work to be done in the Lord's vineyard. She says, everywhere, and that's true, isn't it? No one is to wait for a regular process before they make any efforts. They should take up the work right where they are. We're coming to a point. There should be many at work in what are called irregular lines. If 100 laborers would step out of the regular lines and take up self-sacrificing work, such as Brother Shireman has done, souls would be won to the Lord. We're talking about, we're talking about ministry. And the workers would understand by experience what it means to be laborers together with God. So she says we should take up the work right where we are. There should be many at work in what are called irregular lines. Question, are the irregular lines designed to split off from the regular lines? I had a situation, a sister that we know, my wife and I, very dear sister. It was last year, I believe. She had an idea where she wanted to and I'm not going to say what state she was in, what part of the country she was in, but she had this idea. She was impressed to go out and start dis distributing on her own, by her own unction, with the impression and leading of the Holy Spirit, start distributing spirit of prophecy literature in neighborhoods and places in this particular town. So what she did now was, and again, now this is not a condemnation. I'm just giving you the facts. What she did now was, out of, out of respect, and again, you don't have to get permission to do this. We are commissioned to go, go into all the world, right? Go. So she, out of respect, she asked the local church pastor if she could put the information of the church, have it printed or stamped inside of these books or pamphlets or tracts. So when the people might have questions about the information inside of the literature, they would have a place, a local place or church to call to get information on maybe how they could learn more or obtain some Bible studies. So she was told by the, the local pastor, well, that's a good idea. Why don't we wait until we have our next board meeting in a month or two, and we'll bring that to the table and discuss it. Now, my, 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 my first reaction to that was, 
we can't wait on board meetings necessarily. There could be souls out there that are waiting, just waiting on the edge of their seats. And Sister White brings this out, waiting literally for a knock on the door for somebody to give them some information. So this is the, the, the dichotomy. This is the, the issue. This is maybe the concern, if I can use that term, regarding the regular and irregular lines. And of course, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. Of course, this is not in every single case. Please don't take this the wrong way. I'm giving you one little example, but it's a legitimate example. You're not required to get permission from church leaders to do the work that Jesus told us and commissioned us to do in Matthew 28. We're not, we're not told we have to ask permission for that at all. So are the irregular lines designed to split off from the regular lines? Answer, I know that the Lord loves his church. It is not to be disorganized or broken up into independent atoms. There is not the least consistency in this. There is not the least evidence that such a thing will be. Hmm. Those who shall heed this false message, she calls it, and try to leaven others or influence others will be deceived and prepared to receive advanced delusions, and they will come to naught. So Jesus had a ministry. Did, did Jesus teach in his ministry daily in the church, in the synagogue? Yes, he did. Did Jesus make his top priority to reform his church? Yes, he did. Did he utilize his ministry, his three and a half year ministry to do that? Yes, he did. Did he start, go off and start another church? No, he didn't. Question, did Jesus separate himself from the church during his ministry? Again, I'm coming to a point regarding this lesson. Answer 1A, and he taught how often? Daily in the temple, according to Luke 19, 47. 1B, Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort. And in secret have I said nothing. Question, does the Holy Spirit work with people in ministry? Is that a fair question? My wife and I, we have a ministry. The hosting ministry, HMEC, has that's a ministry, right? So does the Holy Spirit work with people in ministry? Let's go to the Bible, Luke 3, 1 through 3, verses 1 through 3. Let's see what the Word of God has to say. Listen carefully. Lord, again, please bless your words in Jesus' name. Amen. I love this passage. It says it all. Verse 1 of Luke 3. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, being governor of Judea, are governors important? Yes. Are they in leadership? Yes, they are. And Herod, being tetrarch of Galilee, are tetrarchs important? Yes. Are they in powerful leadership positions? Yes, they are. In case you're not familiar with that term, tetrarchs are, are part of a four-winged or a four-headed, I call them the four-headed monster, but they're a, a quadruple leadership uh, entity that exists in Rome, four Roman rulers or leaders that, that rule over certain territories. So, and Herod being Tetrarch of Galilee, that's one, and his brother Philip, Tetrarch of Iturea, that's two, and of the region of Trachonitis, excuse me, and Lysanias, the Tetrarch of Abilene. We got three of those out, out of four, right? So, these are all very powerful individuals here. You have a governor and three Tetrarchs. Listen, verse 2, and Anas and Caiaphas, and Caiaphas, or Caiaphas, I like to pronounce, it should be pronounced, being the high priests, are high priests important? Are they in leadership position? Absolutely. So you have, you have a governor here, you have one tetrarch, two tetrarchs, three tetrarchs, you have high priests here, two of them. What happens after that? We're given these, all these high power people but look what the Bible says. The word of God came unto who? John, the son of Zacharias, where? In the wilderness. So what the, the word of God did or the Holy Spirit actually did is basically leapfrog over all these powerful individuals in world government, in church government, church leaders, and went straight to a brother that had his own ministry. And where was he living? In the country. Did you get the lesson? Verse 3, what happened when he received the word of God? The Bible says in the next verse, and he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Beautiful lesson, brother, sister. Beautiful lesson. 
So do ministries have an important place in God's work? They absolutely do. Absolutely. Speaking of the church, 7 Testimony 62, repeating from the other night, we have come to a time when every member, how many members? Every member of the church should take hold of medical missionary work. Every person should have a knowledge of nature's remedial agencies and how to apply them. Hmm. It is essential. What does essential mean? Necessary. Both to understand the principles involved in the treatment of the sick and to have a practical training that will enable one to rightly use this knowledge. All right. The use of natural remedies requires an amount of care and effort that many are not willing to give. Nature's process of healing and upbuilding or rebuilding or building back is gradual. And to the impatient, it seems slow. That's a very important point. So you have an individual who's been smoking and drinking alcohol all their life. Say they're they're now they're 50 years old. And they are brought the wonderful health reform message of the third angel. So they start making changes. They remove the causes of their conditions, right? The causes. You go to the eight laws, you identify the cause and the cause, you find the cause, you find the cure. So she's saying if it took you 50 years or even your adult life, if it took 30 years for you to get to the point where you are now with this, with this affliction, you start applying nature's remedial agencies, it's not going to take two weeks to, re to restore your health. It's going to be a long process. Upbuilding is gradual. Are you with me? Let me go back and finish that. The surrender of hurtful indulgences requires what? Sacrifice. It certainly, it certainly does. But in the end, it will be found that nature, untrammeled, does her work wisely and well. Those who preserve, persevere excuse me, in obedience to her laws will reap the reward in health of body and health of mind. Are they related? Is there a sympathy, a close sympathy between the two? Absolutely. Wonderful counsel. Councils on Health, page 533, paragraph one. I wish to tell you that soon there will be no work done in ministerial lines, but medical missionary work. None. So is that like a very important work? Is that the work that Jesus did? Was that 100% part of his ministry? It absolutely was. We proved that the other night. Jesus didn't just come to this earth to do the work, brother, sister. He was the work. He was consumed by the work. So what is true, true medical missionary work? Is this true medical missionary work, iridology? All right, kind of quiet out there. How about this? Is this true medical missionary work? This? This gentleman looks very comfortable sitting on the, the white sandy beaches somewhere, maybe in one of the Caribbean islands, amen? Looks very comfortable and content. Is this God's plan? How about this? Is this true medical missionary work? How about Brother Hen? How about this? Is this true medical missionary work? Can I, with God's help, put my hands up to my computer screen? Does the Zoom audience can see what I'm doing and see my hands and I can heal you through this, this little metal plated device, my laptop? That's not God's plan either, is it? Brother, sister, the work of the true medical missionary is largely a spiritual, spiritual work. That's what it is. We should ever remember that the object of the medical missionary work is to point sin sick men and women to the man of Calvary, who taketh away the sin of the world. I'm going to skip down to here. Point them to the one Jesus who can heal both physical and spiritual disease, physical and spiritual. God waits to see what those who have been enlightened by his truth will do. Again and again, he has called for his ministers to be shepherds to the flock. He is now waiting for the cooperation of his human agents, waiting for the ministers to minister to the diseased lambs and sheep that are ready to die. Oh, will not the ministers of God, as obedient children, take up one line of work after another as he presents to it to them? Every herald of the gospel, get this, is to be a minister indeed. So you accept Jesus as your personal savior. 
you are now a minister. There will be no one in heaven who has a crown with no jewels in it. There will be no jewel-less crowns in heaven. We all have to win somebody. Amen? So she says, we just read and confirmed the fact that we are all ministers once we accept Christ. It's time to go to work. Amen? You will never be ministers after the gospel order till you show a decided interest in medical missionary work. Hmm. Luke, the writer of the gospel that bears his name, was a medical missionary. In the scriptures, he is called the beloved physician, Colossians 4.14. Now listen carefully to this next sentence. The apostle Paul heard of his skill as a physician and sought him out as one to whom the Lord had entrusted a special work, a special work. I wonder what work that was. After a time, Paul left Luke at Philippi in Macedonia. Here he continued to labor for several years, both as a physician and as a teacher of the gospel. So he was a doctor and he was also a medical missionary. He was both. So he combined the two works together into one perfect union. Let's see that. In his work, meaning Luke, as a physician, he ministered to the sick and then prayed for the healing power of God to rest upon the afflicted ones. Thus, the way was open for the gospel message. Did you get the lesson there? So you minister to the sick, you pray for the healing power of God, and then you have an opportunity to share more truth based on the fact that this person now has been started on, been put on the pathway to total restoration and recuperation. That's God's plan. Luke's success as a physician gained for him many opportunities for preaching Christ among the heathen. Did you get that? I'm going to repeat that. Luke's success as a physician, a medical missionary, gained for him many opportunities for preaching Christ among the heathen. You made me feel better. What more do you have? I'll listen to anything you have to say. That's God's plan. It is the divine plan that we shall work as the disciples worked, who worked as Jesus worked. Physical healing is bound up with the gospel commission. In the work of the gospel, teaching and healing, teaching and healing, teaching and healing, brother, sister, teaching and healing are never, never to be separated. Never. The medical missionary work should be a part of the work of every church in our land. Every church. There are one million Adventists on the books, church books in the North American division, I believe, maybe a little over that now. Every church. Is that happening? Disconnected from the church, it would soon become a strange medley of disorganized Adams. So medical missionary work along with the church. They have to be combined. The church has to be functioning in this way with this work. Listen, in new fields, no work. How much work? No work is so successful as medical missionary work. Interesting. Again and again, I have been instructed that the medical missionary work is to bear the same relation to the work of the third angel's message that the arm and hand bear to the body. Remember, I showed you the body, the body of Christ, the body of the church. The right arm, the right hand have to be connected. And what is the right hand and right arm? We're going to read that in a second. Next, the right hand is used to open doors or create opportunities through which the body may find entrance, the church, the word, right? The church. This is the part the medical missionary work is to act. It is to largely prepare the way for the reception of the truth for this time. A body without hands is useless. Therefore, the body which treats indifferently the right hand, refusing its aid, is able to accomplish how much? Nothing. Nothing at all. Next point. Medical missionary work is the right hand of the gospel. It is necessary to the advancement of the cause of God. Necessary. Mm. Essential. 
I can see in the Lord's providence that the medical missionary work is to be a great entering wedge, mm, whereby the diseased soul may be reached, may be reached. Are we getting the lesson here? When properly conducted, the health work is an entering wedge, making way for other truths to reach the heart. Oh, that's beautiful. God has a perfect plan, my brothers and sisters. It is fail safe. Listen. When the third angel's message is received in its fullness, health reform will be given its place in the councils of the conference, in the work of the church, in the home, at the table, and in all the household arrangements. Then the right arm will serve and protect the body. Mm. Beautiful. Begin to do medical missionary work when I have a full-fledged outpost and sanitarium set up and ready to go. Is that what inspiration says? No. Begin to do medical missionary work with the conveniences which you have at hand. Do you have a room? Do you have a bed? Do you have running water? Get started today. Do you have a Bible? You will find that thus the way will open for you to hold Bible readings. Wait a minute now. You mean... If I start to do medical missionary work with what I have right now, maybe a stethoscope, maybe like I just said, fresh water, fresh air, sunshine, I'll have an opportunity and the way will be open for me to hold Bible readings just by doing that. The Heavenly Father will place you in connection with those who need to know how to treat their sick ones. God will cooperate with you and with me because that is God's plan. I think it can't be any more clearer than that, my brethren. Every city is to be entered by workers trained to do medical missionary work. As the right hand of the third angel's message, God's method, method excuse me, <clears throat> of treating disease will open doors for the entrance of present truth. Present truth. Mm, wonderful. As a means of overcoming prejudice and gaining access to minds, medical missionary work must be done, not in one or two places only, but in many places where the truth has not yet been proclaimed. We are to work as gospel medical missionaries to heal the sin-sick souls by giving them the message of salvation. This work will break down prejudice as nothing else can. Do you believe that? Do you believe the prophet? Those who disparage the ministry and try to conduct the medical missionary work independently are trying to separate the arm from the body. That's certainly not God's plan. What would the result be? What should be or would be the result should they succeed? We should see hands and arms flying about, dispensing means without the direction of the head. Means meaning money. The work would become disproportionate and unbalanced. That which God designed should be the hand and arm would take the place of the whole body, and the ministry would be belittled or altogether ignored. This would unsettle minds and bring in confusion. And many portions of the Lord's vineyard would be left unworked. So you have to have the entire body with all the extremities, all the limbs connected to have a successful work, a successful ministry, a successful ministry. Question, is this medical missionary work? Yes, it is. It appears the sister is in a foreign country, which is a, always a blessing, always a blessing. Amen. Brothers and sisters, is this medical missionary work? Yes, it is. Is medical missionary work always going to be pretty and attractive? No, it isn't. This is a ministry, a brother and a couple of brothers I know, young ministers in Arkansas have a wonderful ministry there, and God is really blessing them. Sanitarium, restaurant, store, they're really, really, really being blessed and led by the Lord. My point is, it's not going to always be Red roses. This is a this is a serious work that requires serious serious leading by the Lord. But this sister has accepted Christ. I've been told, and she is accepting Bible studies, and she feels much better than she felt before she started receiving treatment from these brothers. 
So this is a great work. It's a serious work. It is not always a pretty work, but it needs to be done. God's purpose in giving the third angel's message to the world is to prepare a people to stand true to him during the investigator judgment. Remember this quote? Now I'm going to read these six bullet points again. This is the purpose for which we establish and maintain our publishing houses, our schools, our sanitariums, hygienic restaurants, treatment rooms, and food factories. Now this time on the quote, I have hygienic restaurants highlighted. Well, what is that? Hmm. Well, here's one called the welcome table. This one is located in roughly around Middle Tennessee. There's a ministry there called Change by Beholding Ministries. Beautiful family, the Jones family. They left the country a couple of years ago and God led them to get involved with the, with the med medical missionary work and the health work. And the Lord led them to open up a restaurant in a town in Tennessee. And these are a few shots of their, of their restaurant. The welcome table. Isn't that nice? So what God wants us to do with those six bullet points, brothers and sisters, is a very, very serious thing. Now, if you notice here, they have a shelf set up in the middle of the restaurant where they have health literature. You see, because those bullet points, remember, those are lines. Our purpose in carrying forward the work, our purpose is to preach the third angel's message to prepare people to do what? To stand. So you're not concerned when you have a hygienic restaurant opened up, brothers and sisters. Your main concern is not to have people come in and have a nice meal and we'll see you next month when you come back again. No, our mission with every line of work in the cause is to give people the third angel's message. So they come into your hygienic restaurant, they come into your treatment room, your food factory, your publishing house. What are they going to get? They're going to get the third angel's message. They can't leave. They can't leave your establishment or your line of work until they receive the third angel's message. And this is what this family is doing right here. The third angel's message. There's the Jones family there. Amen. The welcome table. Listen, in an interview between Sister White and Elder W.C. White, August 7th, 1902, Sister White referred to the object of establishing hygienic restaurants. Listen very carefully, very carefully. She said, I have been instructed. Now, if she's been instructed. I'm going to circle this word here with my cursor. If she's been instructed, brothers and sisters, who instructed her? Well, of course, God did. God instructed her. She said, I have been instructed that one of the principal reasons that hygienic restaurants and treatment rooms should be established in the centers of large cities and even small cities, right, is that by this means, by what means, setting up hygienic restaurants and treatment rooms in large cities, by this means the attention of leading men, important people from the world's point of view, will be called where? To the third angel's message. Did you get the point? That is God's plan. Again, noticing, Sister White continues, noticing that these restaurants are conducted in a way altogether different from the way in which ordinary restaurants are conducted. Men of intelligence, she says, will begin to inquire, ask questions into the reasons for the difference in business methods, methods, and will investigate the principles that lead us to serve superior food. Hmm. So is that the purpose? Is that God's purpose for establishing and maintaining publishing houses, schools, our sanitariums, et cetera, et cetera? Thus, they will be led to a knowledge of the message for this time. Hmm. Does God's plan work? Sure it does. The interview continues, W.C. White, asking a question to his mom. Listen, then you think that it is better to reach the people by arresting their attention through the closing of our restaurants on the Sabbath than through the serving of pure food on that day, the Sabbath day, to keep their stomachs in good condition on the Sabbath as well as on other days? Sister White answered with one word, certainly. In other words, certainly we need to close our restaurants on the Sabbath. W.C. White, but the objection is raised by some that the people need our foods and cannot secure them elsewhere on the Sabbath. 
Should they be refused the privilege of eating at our restaurants on the Sabbath? It's just the White's answer. We are not to conform to the wishes of the world in any particular when these wishes are to in conflict with God's law. The Sabbath day, Sister White says, is to be kept holy unto the Lord. Our hygienic restaurants are not to remain open on that day, the Sabbath. Let the patrons have one day during which to think of the difference between the food that we serve them on weekdays and the food that is served elsewhere, and they will more highly appreciate our restaurants. In other words, they'll see a line of demarcation. And the bottom line is, brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit is in this. God is in this. You have to honor God. Second of uh, uh, First Samuel two thirty, the Bible says, "God says, those who honor God, honor me, I will honor." So that's important. Mrs. White continues, Sister White. When thinking men find that our restaurants are closed on the Sabbath, they will begin to make inquiries in regard to the principles that lead us to close our doors on Saturdays. Listen, in answering their questions, listen, we shall have opportunity to acquaint them with the truth. We can give them copies of our periodicals and tracts. Is that what's happening at the welcome table? And plenty of other hygienic restaurants around the country, plenty of them. Time wouldn't allow me to investigate and show you more. So that they may be able to understand the difference between God's people and the so-called Christian world. Give them literature and let the Holy Spirit do the rest. She continues. W.C. White, asking another question to his mom. Should tracts be given to the people within these restaurants? Mm. Sister White responds, our tracts are to be distributed everywhere. The truth is to be sown beside all waters, for we know not which will prosper, this or that. Let the Holy Spirit worry about that. Give the books, the MAGA books, the tracts, the periodicals, give them out. That's our work. In our erring judgment, we may think it unwise to give literature to the very ones who would accept the truth most readily. Isn't that true? We know not what may be the results of giving away a leaflet containing present truth. Present truth. Question. Can you show an example of how not to set up a sanitarium or outpost center? Hmm. I'm sure we're all familiar with this location here, Battle Creek Sanitarium, Battle Creek, Michigan. This is a newsletter that was set up, written by Agatha Thrash, the former director of health at Wow, I'm sorry, at Uti Pines Lifestyle Center. And she quoted something that W.D. Frazee said in and W.D. Frazee, for those of you who don't know W.D. Frazee, he was the founder of Wildwood Lifestyle Center. All right. I'm going to highlight this quote that she quoted from W.D. Frazee. He said, medical missionary work, actually it was from Sister White. Medical missionary work is yet in its what? Infancy. Let's highlight that. Medical missionary work is yet in its infancy. Letter 210. She wrote that in 1903. Keep that date in your mind, 1903. Who is that? John Harvey Kellogg, Battle Creek Sanitarium. He lived from 1852, born in 1852, died in 1943, was an American medical doctor, nutritionist, inventor, health activist, eugenicist, and businessman. He was a brilliant, very brilliant man. He was the director of the Battle Creek Sanitarium in Battle Creek, Michigan. The sanitarium was founded by members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. All right, let's continue. Kellogg invented a range of exercise equipment for his patients and sought to improve the patient's diet. He developed and patented a variety of new foods, including granola and cornflakes, peanut butter, soy milk, and imitation meats. The Lord used this man mightily, mightily. Sister White says that the Lord would work, angels would work through this man's hands as he performed surgery. He was a man of God, but the brother, the brother went wayward. We're going to see that. So these are some of the modalities that were established at the sanitarium. Some water therapies here. 
more water therapy, hydrotherapy taking place here at Battle Creek. More hydrotherapy. Cold compress to the forehead. Amen. Exercise class outside of the sanitarium. That is Battle Creek in the background. Now I'm going to bring something up that is very important for all of us on this line who are going to assume and trust we're all Christians. This is an exercise class. Over here you have, to the left, you have men. Over here you have women. Question, is that God's plan? No, it isn't. That is not God's plan. To have men and women exercising or co-ed exercise classes, that's not God's plan. If you notice here, I'm gonna say this, some of you have seen me go through this in the past. I'm gonna say this as respectfully and discreetly as I can. The women over here to the right are positioned in a very uncompromising position. This brother right here is looking. Question, is that God's plan? No, we're talking about Christ plain, clear Christian protocol. They shouldn't be exercising in the same class, and this brother shouldn't have a point of view that he should not be looking at. These are all, should be, all the employees here or staff or workers should be Christian-minded, Christ-minded, and very serious and solemn about their work. Exercise class again. <clears throat> again, you have men and women in this exercise class. That's not God's plan, number one. Number two, if you look directly across the street from Battle Creek, you see a residence. There are residential homes. There's a residential neighborhood directly across the street within a rock-throwing distance of Battle Creek Sanitarium. Question, is this God's plan? No, it is not. Remember, the sanitariums are supposed to be located where? In the country, in neighbor, in, in nature, excuse me. Far enough away where they won't have the influence of city life, but not too far where they can't evangelize the city. We went through that, that protocol the other day. Remember that? Sanitarium Battle Creek Cooking School. There are a lot of workers in this kitchen, aren't there? A lot of workers, at least two dozen. Question, is this God's plan? No, it is not. Dining hall, Sanitarium Battle Creek. Main dining room is what it's written down here at the bottom. This is not your, your typical small dining area. That's a very large place to eat, isn't it? Question, again, is this God's plan? No, it is not. So Sister White, again, medical missionary work is yet in its infancy. She wrote that in 1903. What does she mean? The meaning of genuine medical missionary work is known by, by, by but few. Why? Because the Savior's plan of work has not been followed. God's money has been misapplied. In many places, practical evangelistic medical missionary work is not being done. Practical. Now, here's a quote by W.D. Frazee. Again, founder, for those of you who are not familiar with his name, he was the founder of Wildwood Lifestyle Center. Listen, it is not our purpose here to criticize men and women of the world to whom the care of the sick may be merely a profession and a means of making money. We are pointing out that this is not genuine medical missionary work. It is not following the example of Jesus. It does not pass through the first sieve. And we know a sieve is... It is a filter, right? A screen, a filtering screen. Sister White says, we are not to cover mercy with selfishness and then call it medical missionary work. In other words, she's saying, or she's asking the question, what is our motive in getting involved with the work? What is our motive? WD for Z again. The true medical missionary is moved by the spirit of loving service, not by professional pride or the desire of money. Genuine medical missionary work is sacrificial, sacrificial. Christ, the great medical missionary, has left us an example in order that we should follow his steps, right? First Peter chapter 2, verse 21. Who will follow in his steps, ministering in his name, not for money, but for love's sake, love for our fellow men, women, and children. Amen. So Battle Creek. Many of the men and women who should be out in the field Working as medical missionary evangelists, helping those engaged in the gospel ministry are collected in Battle Creek. What does she mean by that? They're collected. They're colonizing. Acting over the same program that has been acted over in the past. Confining the forces, binding them up in one place. That's not God's plan. 
God has spoken against this by sending his judgments upon the institutions in Battle Creek. Uh-oh. God did send his judgments, didn't he? Now, we're not going to have enough time tonight to go all the way through the entire thing, but we're going to touch on it. We will touch on it. So being collected, the saints in one place, colonizing, that's not God's plan. Sister White warns us that we should not colonize in terms of where we move to when we leave the city to go to the country. And I'm not, again, I'm not trying to condemn anyone or step on anyone's toes. I'm just telling you the truth. Do you want the truth? The Bible says the truth shall make you free. There are a lot of groups, families, maybe five families, 10. I've heard as many as 19, 20 families coming together, buying a piece of property, and then settling on these properties. When too many of us are congregated in one place or colonized in one place, the work is stifled. We're supposed, we're supposed to, and this is clear Bible teaching, to have, first of all, go to Genesis 12, 1, ask God where he wants us to move to, where he wants us to be. And then we need a place where we're not overburdened with too many people that are doing the same work in the same place. New fields mean virgin fields, which means fields that have not been worked yet, not been worked. So this theory here or principle of collecting in one location is totally contrary to God's plan for evangelism. God has not given us the work of erecting immense sanitariums, Battle Creek, to be used as health resorts for all who may come. Neither is it his purpose that medical missionary workers should spend a long term of years in college before they enter the field. We know that, right? We just read, start where you are now. Start right now with the conveniences that you have. Amen. She says, never, 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 twice, build mammoth sanitariums. Let these institutions be small. Let there be more of them that the work of winning souls to Christ may be accomplished. Hmm. So small sanitariums, home-like sanitariums, welcoming warm influence in these sanitariums, right? Not intimidating and gigantuan. She uses the word mammoth. It may often be necessary to start sanitarium work in the city, but never build a sanitarium in a city. Rent a building and keep looking for a suitable place where out of the city. In other words, in the country. Did John Harvey Kellogg do that? No, he didn't. And the Lord rebuked him severely for doing what he was doing. Listen, again, this is Review and Herald, February 2nd, 1905. Again, this is a template here for our work as, as medical missionaries. She says, the sick are to be reached, not by massive buildings, but by the establishment of many small sanitariums. Did you get the lesson? Which are to be as light shining in a dark place. Those who are engaged in this work are to reflect the sunlight of Christ's face. By sanitarium work, properly conducted, the right way, God's way, utilizing God's plan, the influence of true Pure religion will be extended to many souls. Amen. Hmm. So we know that the angel set Battle Creek ablaze. God sent his judgments because of what he was doing. Let's go over this a little bit. And we're going to move forward. Rebuke from Ellen White to John Harvey Kellogg. Quote, I have been shown that you are in danger, in great peril of becoming just what the enemy desires you to be unbalanced in mind. Oh, that's scary. Is that scary? Light has been given me that you have carried so-called medical missionary work altogether too far. For a long time, warnings and cautions have been sent to you, Harvey Kellogg, John Harvey Kellogg. You have made this work not the arm, but the body. Didn't we study that a few minutes ago? Is that God's plan? No. The medical missionary work cannot be the body. The gospel is the body with the assistance and, assistance and connection with, cooperation with the right arm and the right hand. God has instructed me, Sister White says, that the work you have set yourself to do is not the work he has given you to do. Have mercy. Have mercy. That is a very, very serious rebuke. Serious. I feel so sorry that Dr. Kellogg has departed from the faith and is seducing other souls. She says, 
His ambition will lead him to take any means to reach the end he desires. He is not scrupulous as to the means by which the objects of his ambition may be attained. He has formed an unchristian and unhallowed friendship with worldlings and with ministers who are not in the faith. I have seen him linked arm in arm with men of the world, talking of such plans of work as were outlined in the New York Observer of August 6, 1896. Remember, this brother had people, had presidents, prime ministers, athletes, Congress people, people high in government, entertainers, celebrities, everybody was coming to this, this, this brother's sanitarium, a princess from overseas, kings, queens, but brother, sister, popularity and fame can be a curse, can it? It's very dangerous, isn't it? It's extremely dangerous. And this brother learned the hard way. I'm going to keep going and get to the crux. Let's get to the crux of the matter. Satan is working Dr. Kellogg's mind and every other mind over which he can obtain influence. That is a very solemn thing. Very solemn. So we read about the Alpha and the Apostasy. The Alpha and the Apostasy of, Omega, of, uh, of Apostasy. Sister White says in that quote, and I meant to put that up, but she actually says verbatim. She says, we are now in the Alpha of this condition. She says, we will soon be in the Omega and it will be of a most startling nature, a most startling nature. Very serious. So the Alpha was the corruption and the infiltration of the Health Institute John Harvey Kellogg, by the devil, and the Omega was going to be, she stated before it came, was going to be the infiltration and corruption by the devil of the education system, which was initially the true education system, which now the devil has corrupted completely. We're going to go through that in a minute. The Alpha and Omega. Listen. The Lord permitted fire to consume the principal buildings of the Review and Herald in the sanitarium and thus remove the greatest objection urged against moving out of Battle Creek. It was his design, God's design, that instead of rebuilding the one large sanitarium, our people should make plants, small sanitarium, small plants in several places. So instead of just one gigantic mammoth one, smaller ones. These smaller sanitariums should have been established where land could be secured for agricultural purposes. Okay, we're going somewhere with this. It is God's plan that agriculture shall be connected with the work of our sanitariums and school. Agriculture? Okay. So we know the sanitarium is set up for the health reform, but there's another element now that we're being taught right here and right now. Our youth need the education to be gained from this line of work. It is well, and more than well, it is essential that efforts be made to carry out the Lord's plan in this respect. What is the Lord's plan? Small, home-like sanitariums. Maybe your home in the country, my home in the country. We don't have to have a large place. Why? Because God says that's not his plan. But also, brother, sister, agriculture has to be associated and attached with it, with it. Remember the first night we set up a nice little foundation by God's grace. We learned that William Miller and Daniel, two prophets that the Lord used mightily, are inextricably linked. Remember that? We learned that the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Remember that? 1 Corinthians 15, 32. Remember that God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. So we learn from that verse in 1 Corinthians 15, 32, that all the prophets in the Bible and even beyond the Bible are all led by the same spirit. So they're all given the same information from the same Holy, Holy Father, God the Father, through the Holy Spirit to his subjects, his prophets, right? So they're all, they're, in other words, they're all in agreement. That's what she's saying. That's what the Bible is saying. So Daniel was a health reformer. William Miller was a rural farmer. We learned that the other night. These are two major building blocks of the third angel's message. Health, temperance, and lifestyle, Brother Daniel, and gardening and agriculture through Brother Miller. Do we see that? 
So God has clearly taken those, taken those building blocks and he used them to promulgate and carry forward the third angel's message. And that's what he wants you and I to do. These are our foundational aspects of our work. So he was told to he was told not to rebuild, but he did rebuild. Did he rebuild a smaller home like sanitarium in the country? No, he did not. Same, same area, same place, and very, very large. So this is Loma Linda Hospital, University Hospital in Loma Linda, California. For those of you who don't know, Loma Linda is located about 65 miles east of downtown Los Angeles. What's interesting to note is that the architecture here, this is the old Loma Linda back here in the background. This new one was, was completed a couple of years ago. The architecture, if you notice here, is kind of kind of similar, isn't it? That's very interesting to me. Who was leading that architectural work? Only God knows. So this is man's wisdom because man doesn't want his institutions located, first of all, in a city, and second of all, being very large. That's not God's plan. This is the LNG White Memorial Hospital located in the heart of Los Angeles. There's also the LNG White Seventh-day Adventist Church located on the same, on the same property. It seats 1,800, I didn't say 18, 1,800 people, 1,800 seats in that church. It's a mega church. Is that God's plan? Hmm. Right over here, you have downtown Los Angeles. You see my cursor? You have the Civic Center. You have the Convention Center. You have Staples Center, the Staples Center right over here. You have Dodger Stadium up here. Careful. A question is, is this, is this God's plan? No. This, again, is man's wisdom. Hmm. You have small structures. You have them spread apart. They're in a rural environment. Question, my brothers and sisters, is this God's plan? Absolutely so. This is God's wisdom. The Madison blueprint. The blueprint? Hmm. Okay. Now, I'm not going to have time to read through every single quote, but we're going to get the high points and the highlights just so you get a better understanding of God's plan. Amen. I mentioned the other night, it might have been last night, God, it was last night, God created a template, a system. Remember, we learned that in the Garden of Eden. It was true education. It was the science of true education. He took that same concept, that principle, his plan, true education, and he picked it up and he carried it down the stream of time, almost 6,000 years, and he planted that same plan, that same science of true education. He set it down in Tennessee, in North Middle Tennessee. In the summer of 1904, Sutherland and McGann had discussed their plans with Mrs. White in Nashville then spent six weeks looking for a suitable location for their school near Nashville. One day in June 1904, Mrs. White, W. Palmer, Sutherland, and McGann, and others took a steamboat for a river trip near Nashville, a city of culture, which had become the center of Adventist activity in the South. Listen, the boat suddenly broke down at Neely's Bend in the Cumberland River and was towed over to the bank so that repairs could be made. We're going to see that was God's providence. Mrs. White and Mr. Palmer went ashore to look around. Now listen very carefully to what happened after that. This is a picture of E.A. Sutherland when he was very young, also Percy McGann or P.T. McGann. This is them on the left, the two on the left when they were much older. This is a picture of some of the pioneers here, including Spalding and McGann. And I'm sorry, also, uh, excuse me, sorry about that. Let me get back to this. Also, E.A. Sutherland. And you see Sister White sitting here, right here in the middle. Amen. They found themselves when they went on a walk on a 412-acre farm, overgrown with buck brush, full of stones and gullies, worn out and run down. Mrs. White returned to the boat and said to Sutherland and McGann, quote, now listen to what she said. She told, she told them, this looks like the place I have seen in vision. This is the place where God wants Sutherland and McGann to start their school. Do we have a God, a Father in heaven, that is intimately involved with all the work he wants done here on earth, intimately involved, and wants to lead us every single inch of the way? 
to get this work done and finished, to finish the work. Upon inspecting the farm, brothers and sisters, the two men were dismayed, for everything they saw was displeasing. Hmm. They didn't have the money to buy the huge farm. Are any of us in that, in that situation right now? They had had a small, attractive, fertile farm in mind. In other, in other words, they wanted a walk-in, they wanted a turnkey situation, didn't they? They sat down together on a rock and wept, but ultimately decided to surrender to their destiny and Mrs. White's advice. So can you imagine these two grown brothers sitting down and weeping, basically because they saw so much work that had to be done, so much work. But brother, sister, that work builds character. Amen. Can you say amen? Amen. The farm known as Nelson's Place, and at the time was known as Nelson's Place or Nelson Place, and at the time owned by Mr. Ferguson was purchased for $12,723, taking its founder's last cent. The school was founded in 1904, and the first term began with 11 students. Is that God's plan? That is God's plan. Yet it grew, and under Ellen White's guidance, its educational philosophy was formed. She called Madison God's beautiful farm, and she had a special love for the work of its founders. I'm going to move forward. Neither a college nor a high school, Madison in its early years was a special school as shown by its name, Nashville Agricultural Normal Institute, indicating training in agriculture, excuse me, which Mrs. White believes should be basic to all other studies. Did you get the lesson? I'm going to skip down here. There was no time for such things. I'm going to, let me skip up here and then I'm going to move forward. This is important. Please listen. Unlike other schools, for example, Madison had no organized athletic program, no sports. There was no time for such things. And students got plenty of exercise through farming and useful work. Amen. Sutherland had inaugurated this concept when, when as president of Battle Creek College, he had plowed up the athletic field to make a vegetable garden. The brother took the initiative. He took charge, didn't he? Amen. Whatever God says. After it got underway, Madison lost no time putting into action its plan of sending teachers to set up Madison-type rural units or hill schools, small schools, to help the impoverished people of the South's hill and mountain country who had no schools. By 1914, some 40 such schools started from Madison were in operation in the South with more than 1,000 students in attendance. Now, don't take this the wrong way now. Don't be confused. 1,000 students. Remember, you got 40 schools divided by 1,000. You have about 25 students per school. That is God's plan. Amen. So where did the idea for this type of school originate from, saints? Remember, education, page 20, paragraph two, remember this. The system of education instituted at the beginning of the world was to be a model for man throughout all after time. Remember that? A model, a model. I'm going to skip through this. So turning point number one, the, the, the what we call, what Sister White called the Omega of apostasy. The College of Medical Evangelists or Loma Linda University did what in 1912? They received accreditation in 1912. In other words, they allied themselves with the world. 1931, turning point number two, three SDA universities, Emmanuel Missionary College in Berrien Springs, of course, we know that is, that is the current school now, which is Andrews, PUC Pacific Union College in Angwin, California, and Walla Walla in College Place, Washington, all receive accreditation the danger of accreditation. One, in 1911, Ellen G. White spoke out against accreditation. She said, better to close all of our institutions than to receive money from the world, not one dime. Two, the line of demarcation disappears. The SDA movement now can't be considered peculiar. Is that correct? Well, we're, we're, we're supporting you. We're giving you money now as the government. You can't tell us not to serve meat in our institutions and hospitals. This we we own you now. We support you. We are we are facilitating you now monetarily. We are calling all the shots now. Is that true? Three. The state now dictates what our schools teach, 
eat, drink, wear, and how and when to worship, how and when to work and to worship, including the Sabbath. By the 1940s, brothers and sisters, all of our colleges and universities, every single one, were accredited by the state, all of them. So Battle Creek <clears throat> opened in 1866 as the Western Health Reform Institute, closed in 1942. The Madison School, the Blueprint, opened 1904, closed 1964. The College of Medical Evangelists, Loma Linda, opened in 1906, currently operates as a world-renowned, cutting-edge conventional medical hospital, best known for utilizing modern drugs for cancer treatment. There are, on all the radio stations, the major radio stations in Southern California, and I've heard them for years, they have commercials, Loma Linda, boasting about the fact that they are a cutting-edge, world-renowned, conventional medical hospital and that they are the top of the list regarding cancer treatment by drugs. What happened to God's work, his institution? LNG White Memorial Hospital opened 1913, currently operates as a conventional medical hospital. Same thing, same thing. Listen, in our sanitariums, the sick are to be healed and they are to receive a knowledge of right methods of living. You are making a right move in establishing a sanitarium on the large tract of land you purchased for the Madison School. She's talking to, to Sutherland and McGann. The building may be simple, yet perfect in all its arrangements. Watch this. Let it be a model, a model that others may copy, a model. So your home sanitarium in the country should be a mini Madison. That's what she's saying. So your country outpost center, number one, you have workers. They have, they have to be consecrated and self-sacrificing. That is very important, very important. We learned that, didn't we, from, from Battle Creek. Health guests coming in, workers going out to do the work, health guests coming in. So your country outpost center is a country training base. It's a city mission training base, and it's also a family home-like environment. That's God's plan. So this is the blueprint for the outpost center training base. And you have all these little, all the ancillary training success missions involved and connected to it. Outpost training center here, city mission down here, better living training centers. So we have home sanitariums here. That's what we've been discussing for the last 15, 20 minutes at least. But this is vitally connected to several of all the other arms of the work. Watch. Home sanitariums, health education, medical evangelistic training, health guests, health food stores, correct? Health clinics, treatment rooms, cooking schools, health evaluations, of course, right? Consultations, simple treatments, cooking and health instruction, home nursing treatment, health lectures, house to house work, literature evangelism, Bible work. My wife conducted a natural remedies class at our, at our local church about a month and a half, two months ago. On two consecutive Sundays, it was a great blessing. That's what God calls us to do, to do the work. God will open the doors. And the saints at that church loved it, heard things they had never heard. That's God's plan. Amen. How about the gardening, the agriculture? Remember, we talked about what the health now. We're talking about Daniel the prophet, right? We're talking about a foundation. Now we go to the agriculture, we're talking about William Miller. Home gardens or gardening or agriculture is connected with, of course, it's connected with food products. Home sanitariums, right? Agriculture always connected, industrial training, health education. Do we pick certain foods and herbs from the garden? Yes, we do. Health food stores from the garden, hygienic restaurants, absolutely. Clinics, treatment rooms, cooking schools, simple treatments cooking and health instruction, home nursing treatments, Christian health work, health lectures, workers' homes with gardens, of course, and of course, guests. Amen. Amen. The Remember this now. We went over this the other day. The employment God gave to Adam before sin was to till the ground. Remember that? The employment God gave to Adam after sin was to till the ground. Same job. The Bible says God doesn't change. We know that again, Malachi 3.6 and Hebrews 
Therefore, God's original plan for man hasn't changed either. So agriculture has to always be in the picture, health and agriculture. Amen. As a relaxation from study, occupations pursued in the open air and affording exercise for the whole body are the most beneficial. No, how many? No line of manual training is of more value than what? Agriculture. A greater effort should be made to create and to encourage an interest in agricultural pursuits. Let the teacher call attention to what the Bible says about agriculture, that it was God's plan for man to do what? To till the earth, that the first man, the ruler of the whole world, was given a garden to cultivate, and that many of the world's greatest men, its real nobility, have been tillers of the soil. Madison School. The school at Madison not only educates in a knowledge of the scriptures, but it gives a practical training that fits the student to go forth as a self-supporting missionary to the field to which he is called. In his student days, he is taught how to build, simply and substantially, how to cultivate the land and care for the injured. Continue. This training for medical missionary work is one of the grandest objects for which any school can be established. The time is soon coming when God's people, because of persecution, is that going to happen? Yes, will be scattered in many countries. Hmm. Those who have received an all-around education will have the advantage where they are. You can survive. Amen. The Madison Blueprint. In our sanitariums, the sick are to be healed and they are to receive a knowledge of right methods of living. Remember, she told Sutherland and McGann, you are making a right move in establishing a sanitarium on a large, large tract of land in the country. Let it be a model that a model that others may come and may copy. Excuse me, may copy. So agriculture, a, a model, and sanitarium work, a model as well, that others, you and myself, may copy. Had all our schools encouraged work in agricultural lines, they would now have an altogether different showing. But the instruction which the Lord has been pleased to give has been taken hold of so feebly that obstacles have not been overcome. Look at nature. There is room within her vast boundaries for schools to be established where grounds can be cleared and land what? Cultivated. Cultivated. This work is essential, necessary, to the education most favorable to spiritual advancement. Did you get the lesson there? Most favorable to spiritual advancement? What work? Agriculture, gardening, groundwork. Where does that take place? Or should it take place? In nature, in the country, for spiritual advancement. I say amen. What do you say? For nature's voice, oh, get this. Please get this. For nature's voice is the voice of Christ. Let that sink in. Teaching us innumerable lessons of love and power and submission and perseverance. I can recall not long after we moved to our place, our country home, the second time, I remember we had some trees removed. This brother that lived in the area, we were referred to him. He came here with this huge bulldozer and he started pushing over these trees that were right around the house because we're told by inspiration that we're not supposed to have trees right up against the home or too close to the home because the leaves fall and they, they die and they end up at some point in time becoming moldy, right? And we know that's all very unhealthy. So we had him come and remove about six trees and he pushed the one tree over. This tree had to be maybe this particular tree, I mentioned yesterday, we have trees about 150 to 200 feet on our property. But this one particular tree was maybe, I would say maybe 100 feet, more or less, maybe 100 feet. He pushed this tree over, brothers and sisters. And I'm, I'm familiar, I was always familiar with the root system with a tree. And one of the things I first learned when I moved to the country is that the roots extend exactly as far out as the longest branch on a tree. I learned that. You learn things every day in the country. So I, I learned that right away. But what I didn't know, brothers and sisters, when this brother pushed that tree, started pushing that tree over, 
and it started to bend over and collapse over and pull up from the ground. And all those roots started popping up. When he got down to that ball root, I had never heard of a ball root in my life. City boy, right? City slicker. When that ball root, root came up, it was so humongous. It was so gigantic. It was so large. It was breathtaking. And I read this, this quote a couple of years ago, and I remember thinking about that situation with that tree. Lessons of love, power, submission, and perseverance. Mm. Some do not appreciate the value of agricultural work. He who earns his, earns his livelihood by agriculture escapes many temptations and enjoys unnumbered privileges and blessings denied to those who work, whose work lies in the great cities. Did you get that? And in these days of mammoth trusts and business competition, and that was back then, there are few who enjoy so real an independence and so great certainty of fair return for their labor as does the tiller of the soil. Wow, that is, that is very profound indeed. So model number one, as we wrap up, the system of education instituted in Eden. Model number two, the Madison School in Tennessee. The eternal school will be Eden restored in heaven. Praise the Lord. Watch. Eternity will provide endless opportunity for learning and growth. Heaven is a school. Can you say amen? Its field of study, the universe, its teacher, the infinite one. Remember now, everything started, this template, this system or science began in Eden. How do I know that? She says it in the next sentence. A branch of this school was established in Eden and the plan of redemption accomplished. Education will again be taken up in the Eden school. In other words, Eden restored. Hmm. Isaiah 65, 21. And they, meaning us, if we're faithful, I'm going to get there. How about you? And they shall build houses and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, God says, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands, of their hands. I love this picture. Do you want to be in that crowd entering the holy city, the new Jerusalem? Do you want to be there being welcomed in by the king? Brother, sister, we have, we have to get there. We have to get there. Nothing on this earth should separate us from the love of Jesus. Nothing. And nothing on this earth should keep us from living with him forever. Nothing. Early writing 17. Let's end with a wonderful promise. She says, talking about when we, all, when we all get to heaven, amen. Then we began to look at the glorious things outside of the city, but a real city. Remember, God, in my opinion, is almost like mocking the devil, right? Well, you want to create cities on earth? I'll show you a real city, a city with foundations that will never disappear and never rot. Amen. There I saw most glorious houses that had the appearance of silver, supported by four pillars set with pearls, most glorious to behold. These were to be inhabited by the saints. I hear somebody out there saying amen. In each was a golden shelf. I saw many of the saints go into the houses, take off their glittering crowns, and lay them on the shelf. Then what did they do next? Go out into the field by the houses, our heavenly gardens, and do something with the earth we began to conduct agricultural work in heaven. Not as we have to do with the earth here. No, no. Not with pain, not with stiffness, not sore muscles, not sprained hamstrings, none of that. A glorious light shone all about their heads and they were continually shouting and offering praises to God. Brother, sister, again, this is a wonderful picture. We don't want it to be a myth. We want it to be a reality in our lives. We must get there. Let's talk to God now and let's ask him. Let's plead with him. Lord, fit us for heaven. Make us, make us faithful inhabitants of your eternal kingdom forever, forever. Let us pray.
Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this meeting. We thank you, Lord, for what you've taught us tonight. We thank you, Lord, for helping us to get a better understanding of your word and your message and your plan and your science tonight. We ask, Father, that you would equip us, please. We all yearn to be in your presence. But Lord, on earth in your presence is not enough. We want to be in your presence forever. We want God with us forever. Please fix us. Please help us, Lord. There are things in our lives, and I'm including me, that shouldn't be there. There are things that cross our minds that shouldn't be there. Things pop up in our minds from the past. I've been in your word, Lord, for 26, almost 26 years in this message, pulled from the depths of hell as a brand plucked from the fire. And still, even after all these years, in the wrong place, somewhere where there's music playing, somewhere where there's the wrong kind of food smelled, somewhere where something's going on that I shouldn't even be in the presence of, I need help, Lord. I need help. I am very, very human, as we all are. So I'm praying that you would give us wisdom from heaven, that you would help us to, to calculate our steps, that you would help us, as you say in the Bible, that we would count the cost and recognize how we have to be so fitted only by being so close to you, completely, completely connected with you, communing with you at every opportunity, spending every waking moment meditating on your word, listening to sweet, solemn hymns, sacred hymns, and not letting anything interfere with our connection with you. Help us, Lord, to make a more dedicated decision and choice in our lives to get to heaven, to make it the primary function of our existence to live with you forever. I pray this pray prayer over all those within the sound of my voice, all those who will hear or see the archived version on these, these uh, social media platforms, that we would all, Lord, be gathered together around your wonderful throne when it's all said and done. We want to be on that sea of glass with thee. We love you. <clears throat> we thank you. And we ask it all in Jesus' wonderful, precious, loving, saving name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.